Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this time that we can be here. God, thanks for your word and for the truth that it teaches us, for the way that that can transform our minds, can change our hearts. Father, we ask today that as we come and we hear you speak, God, that our relationships would be different with you and with those around us because of the time that we've spent in this place. So God, open our minds that we may hear the truth of your word. Open our hearts so that we can apply it to ourselves. God, make us better followers of you by the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all of you uh, dads here today. I hope you guys don't get rained out on your cookouts later this afternoon. But, uh, so I don't know about you, but I feel like lately Zach's been meddling just a little bit. You know, it started three or four weeks ago with that whole sermon about controlling people, and my toes got a little bit sore. And then it continued last week when he talked about rest on the Sunday in between two weeks of VBS, and my feet really hurt by the time he was done stepping on them. And then I've said a couple times here at Calvary that, man, I'm, I'm glad I get to preach on this topic because I don't really, this is kind of easy because it's not something that I really deal with. And then he gave me grudges to preach on. And I'm like, now you're just being mean. So, uh, so my life, unfortunately, not the most proud moment of my life, but my life and especially my elementary and teenage years were shaped a lot by grudges that I've held. One in particular, my parents were divorced when I was in elementary school and my dad remarried and, you know, I don't know that my stepmom did anything uh, to... De- to deserve the hatred that I poured out for about two decades of going to visit and not being nice. Uh, And I know, like, teenagers in general, everybody's got that, like, everybody assumes teenagers are just rude and a little grumpy. Uh, This was over-the-top rude and a little grumpy. And um, every weekend I went over, I just was dead set on not being friendly. It didn't matter if I was in a good mood, if she did everything right or not. I was just not going to be friendly because of the grudge that I was going to hold on to. And by the grace of God, every once in a while people come into our lives and sometimes we get to marry them. And my wife looked at me once, we were sitting in St. Louis, and my dad hadn't come out to visit for a while. And I was like, I wonder when my dad's going to come back out. And she, I don't remember exactly the, the context of the conversation, but she said to me in that moment, would you take me someplace where I wasn't going to be treated very nicely? And those words stuck. Obviously, I can, I can remember sitting on the couch in the living room in that apartment over 12 years ago now and hearing her say those words. You see, the truth is forgiveness is the expectation of followers of Christ not an option. Now as people, we like to um, we like to rationalize our sin. We like to kind of say, well, my sin's not as bad as your sin because I don't commit your sin, so it's easier for me to point fingers and look at your sin and critique your sin than it is to look inside of myself and see my own. And so we look at the sins that everybody else critiques and we rank them, Right? So maybe sexual immorality would be the highest one, and then drunkenness might be below that. And you can just kind of keep rating them. And for me, I put unforgiveness down at the bottom, probably right above pride, the other one I struggle with. So, you know, those two sit at the bottom of my list. But God doesn't rank those things. And because we're not God, we don't actually get the right to rank those things. And I think maybe unforgiveness might be one of the most culturally accepted inside and outside of the church sins that we have today. It's a lot easier just to disagree with somebody, have an argument, say things we don't mean, or type them on Facebook or social media, and walk away and never have to talk to them again. But that's not the option that God gives to us. 
And so as we continue in this series called Unsubscribe, where we're looking at all the stuff that's in our lives that clutters our relationship with God and with other people, this week we have to talk about unsubscribing from our grudges. Unsubscribing from that feeling of ill will or discontent from those who have wronged us in one way or the other. You see, whether this is your first time here or your 5,000th time here, we believe God has incredible blessings for each and every one of us, but sometimes we miss those because of the choices we make. Sometimes we miss out on the blessings God has for us because of the choices we make and the ways we choose to live and the ways we choose to treat those who are around us. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 18. That's the passage that Jose just read for us. Or if you don't have it, open up on uh, your Bible app. You can follow along. It's in this passage that Peter starts out with kind of an interesting question. And I don't think at just a cursory glance we get the depth of his question. Peter's the apostle we love to pick on, right? Because Peter's always the first one to act, the last one to think, and then he gets in the middle of acting and he's like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? But this is not a situation like that for Peter in this passage. He's actually been thinking this through. He's been watching Jesus teach. He's been listening to the words and everything that the religious leaders have taught him He's learned and he's figured out along the way that everything they've taught, Jesus seems to take one step further, right? So he says, the law says don't murder. Jesus says if you harbor hatred in your heart, you've already committed murder. All right, so that, this is the law. This is what Jesus said. Okay, got it. All right, so then he watches. He says, don't commit adultery. Jesus says if you look lustfully at a woman, you've committed adultery. All right, one step. So he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus... How many times must I forgive someone who sins against me? Now the teachers, uh, the, the religious teachers and the religious leaders of that time would have said, if someone commits the same sin against you three times, you have to forgive them. On the fourth, it's all over. Right? You don't have to forgive anymore. You can be bitter and, hate and, and angry and all that stuff. And you don't have to forgive on the fourth time. So Peter's like, three, Jesus makes it more difficult. Three doubled is six plus one seven. I'm going to go with seven. And so he says, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother if he sins against me? Is seven good? And Jesus says, "Uh, no, Peter. How about 70 times seven or 490 times? Right, So when, you're, when someone sins against you, when someone wrongs you, when someone hurts you, you have to forgive them 490 times. Now the normal reader of this story is not sitting there going, all right, I better get out my tally sheet. One, two, 320, 489, you got one more time and we're done. The only person who's doing that is the older brother who's looking at how many times his little brother has been annoying. And he's keeping track because he's going to say to him, You're at 488, buddy. You got two left, and I don't have to forgive you anymore. Jesus said so. What Jesus is really saying here is every time, no matter how many times, there is no limit. Your forgiveness should be limitless. sure that paused Peter for a moment. But you see, and here's the bottom line of the sermon. If you want to take a nap for the rest of the time because you're still applying Zach's message from last week about unsubscribing from hurriedness and you need some rest, you can take it. Here's the bottom line. Forgiveness opens our lives to the incredible blessings God has for us. When we learn to forgive, our lives are opened to the incredible blessings that God has for us. And it's in that moment that Jesus launches into the parable about a king who was going to collect on his debts. 
And this brings this man in and he says, you owe me millions of dollars in the translation we read this morning. But in some others, it says you're 10,000 talents in debt. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I go, oh, he's $10,000 in debt. Okay, that's, that's a lot. $10,000 is a lot. But you know, some of us have been more in credit card debt than that. And so we just figure, okay, keep paying, put a little bit more towards it. And in five to 10 years, I'll be out of this debt. It'll be paid off. The king will be happy. Everything will be done, right? Well, that's not really the debt he's in. 10,000 talents. So we're going to do a little bit of ancient math. 10,000 talents, one talent 6,000 denarii. You make one denarii for every day you work. So if you start doing the math or you're good at it, this guy is 60 million days work in debt. Or to bring that down to a number maybe we can comprehend, if you had 10,000 friends or you knew 10,000 people, and you got them to work for 17 years for you and give them every dime they made, then you could pay off this debt. This is a ridiculous debt. It's not something you pay off. There's no way. This guy says, I just need more time. I'll pay it back every dime of it. I don't, if I took all my social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I don't have 10,000 people who know me, period. Let alone that I can convince to give me their life's work for 17 years. But this guy says, I'll pay it back. I promise, don't sell my wife, don't sell my kids, don't sell me into slavery. I'll pay it all back. And this king looks at him. And all of a sudden, he's struck with mercy. And he says, you know what? I'll forgive it all. You're debt free. You don't owe me a dime. Think about that. 60, millions days, 60 million days worth of wages. Gone. A debt you're never going to get out from underneath of. Gone. You see, forgiveness requires, or forgiveness is based on the forgiveness we've received. So the first thing this parable teaches us is that our forgiveness is based on the forgiveness we receive. This is the truth of the gospel at the beginning of this story. You and I are in debt to a loving Heavenly Father, a loving Creator, to a debt we could never, ever, ever, ever work off. We've broken his laws. We've disobeyed what he's asked us to do. We haven't loved him as he's loved us. And each and every one of us is in debt. And when we come and we stand before him, because of his son, Jesus, who came and died on the cross, who three days rose again, he looks at us and he says, debt paid. Debt forgiven. Debt wiped out. You're free. That's the truth of the gospel in my life and in your life. If we believe that Jesus is God's son come to live and die for you and for me, we're free. And God looks at us and says, your debt's been paid. And it's because of that, because of that incredible debt that's paid that Jesus looks at Peter and he says, every time, Peter. He says in Luke, even if they do the same thing to you, even if they wrong you in the same way, seven times in one day, forgive them. So it's not really Zach that's stepping on my toes. It's kind of Jesus. And you got, I can't really do anything about that, Right? And so if Jesus is stepping on your toes, I'm sorry, but this is the truth of Scripture. If someone came to me and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offend you or I'm going to wrong you the same way seven times today, by like the fifth one, I'm going to have a hard time saying, I forgive you. That's exactly what Jesus tells us we have to do. Because of what we've been forgiven, 
And I think we struggle with that because we forget the debt that we've been forgiven of, but we also hold on to our own selfishness. You see, forgiveness, when we choose to forgive someone, we have to let go of our selfishness, of our rights, of our desires, of the things that we want. Because this guy, in maybe what is the most unbelievable parable Jesus tells, gets this incredible debt forgiven, walks outside the king. I would still be like jumping up and down. I'm debt free. I'm free. I'm free. He walks outside. And up comes a buddy who owes him a few thousand bucks. Like, and that's like not, not millions, no, no ancient math to do. He owes him a few thousand dollars. And he grabs him by the throat and demands payment. What? How? What? Hold on, time out. This has to at least be a couple weeks, right? Like he couldn't have literally walked out of just being forgiven and demand payment. No, Jesus says he literally just walked out of the king's presence. How often? I want to be just angry at this guy if I'm honest. What are you doing? But how often do we walk into God's presence, pray, talk to God, Ask him to forgive us of the things we've done against him. Close our Bible. Say amen. Walk out of church and demand our right from somebody else. You see, when we remember what we've been forgiven, we're able to set aside our selfishness. We're able to let go of that. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and lives in our lives, it changes our perspective. There's an incredible story from 2015 when this gunman, 21-year-old guy, walks into an African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina, and opens fire, killing nine people. And when his day in court came, the members of that congregation went to the court. And I think we would read this and think, oh, well, they're going to the courtroom to get what's due them, to let him know how much he's taken from them. One by one, they stood up to testify and let him know that they forgave him. And maybe one of the most impactful statements was from Nadine Collier, who stood up and the first thing she said is, I forgive you. I'm the daughter of 70-year-old Ethel Lance. You took something very precious from me. I'll never talk to her again. I will never, ever hold her again. But I forgive you, and I pray God has mercy on you. How would that change the way those outside the church Those who want nothing to do with Jesus looked at those of us inside the church. If stories like that were what were most common. I admit I struggle with grudges. But I think it's way too common inside the church too. I think if you've been in the same church for a long time, there's probably somebody who maybe you used to sit in the same section with or even in the same pew with who now sits on the other side of the sanctuary or who you attend a different service so you don't have to see or you quit volunteering and helping out in a ministry because that relationship was so fractured it was too painful to walk back into. Or worse yet, maybe they've left and went to another church because it's just too hard. And an unbelieving world who needs to know the love of their Savior looks in on us and says, I don't want anything to do with that. And I'm not sure I blame them. You see, church, we have a responsibility to remember what we've been forgiven 
and to allow that to motivate us to set aside our own selfish desires and our own selfish wants and to forgive those around us. When we choose to forgive someone, we're reminded of everything we have to be grateful for. When we give up our selfish desires and we forgive those who wronged us, gratefulness begins to take root in our heart and our lives. You see, that's exactly the opposite of what happened in the parable that Jesus tells. This man gets forgiven and he goes out and he's not grateful. But ungratitude will destroy our lives. Now, when I was in college, I know some of you are really going to struggle to believe this, but when I was in college, I didn't really like rules. Even as an adult, I still really don't like rules. I taught the middle school kids this year that rules are meant to be broken, and that backfired on me. But I really don't think rules change a lot, but I went to a small Christian college. If you know anything about small Christian colleges, they have lots of rules. So I spent a lot of time on third floor in the administrative offices of my college. I didn't tell them this in the interview. And I, <laughs> that was a delayed laugh, that was great. So I spent a lot of time up there and I walked away with a diploma and a lot of frustration because of individual conversations I'd had, because of things that I didn't think were fair, because of, and some of them I was right on, some of them I was wrong on. But I walked away from my university, and I didn't walk away proud. Everybody's like, oh yeah, I'm an alumnus of this, and I was not a proud alumni. I was super frustrated by my college experience. I was glad I had the diploma, glad I got to move on, glad I got to get a job, and didn't care if I ever went back. And what holding on to that bitterness and that grudge did in my life, it caused me to miss a lot of the things that God did in my life in the midst of that time there. I had a Bible professor who probably taught me more about the Bible than anybody in my entire life who was one of the most knowledgeable men I've ever known. He worked on the NIV Bible translation, and I sat in seven classes under him. And I wasn't thankful for that. I was just frustrated that I had to go through this process. My advisor was one of the most godly men, one of the best pastors I've ever known, and I got to sit in his office anytime I wanted because it was a small school and talk about life and ministry and what it looked like and I got to gain from his 35 years of pastoral ministry knowledge at that time. But I didn't remember all that because I just wanted to be angry. I met my wife there, who now, almost 19 years later, I love more than I ever thought I could. But I didn't want to remember that. I just wanted to hold on to my frustration. I didn't want to be grateful. Until one day a friend asked me to come back. They were teaching a class there. And she said, hey, would you come and guest speak at my class? And I was pretty sure the doors of the university were just going to catch fire the minute I walked through. Or that the police would be there to haul me off when I came through because I was not going to be welcomed back on campus. And it was in that time as I reflected back and had grown up a little bit and had matured and realized this is dumb. I have so much to be grateful for. This university has done so much for my life. The people I've met here, the relationships I've formed here have transformed me. You see, when we hold on to our grudge, when we won't unsubscribe from our grudge, we can't be grateful. And we live in a world right now that is characterized by ungratefulness. Spend less than five minutes on Twitter or Facebook, and I guarantee you, you will not feel grateful about the world around you. And church, if we're supposed to live different than the world around us, we need to learn to live, and we need to teach our kids and our grandkids how to be grateful. 
And that means we need to unsubscribe from those grudges so we can see all that we have to be grateful for, so that we can allow that to continue in our lives. And the last thing, when we forgive, we give joy the opportunity to build in our lives. Forgiveness builds joy in our lives. Again, we don't see that. At the end of this parable, the guy ends up thrown in jail. It's the opposite of joy. Jesus tells another parable about the prodigal son, and maybe you know it, but it's about a younger son who demands from his dad his share of the inheritance before his dad passes away. He goes and wastes it. He ends up starving and hungry and broke in a foreign country. He comes back to his dad, begs for forgiveness. His dad wraps his arms around him, loves him, and throws a party and says, this son who is lost has come home. Let's have a party. Because when God, when we come back and we ask God for forgiveness for the things we've done against him, for the ways we've wronged him, he throws a party and celebration for us. As he freely gives and lavishes, Paul says in Ephesians, he lavishes his forgiveness on us. And as he does that, the older brother stands arms crossed from a distance. And he's angry. He's angry because according to him, I've served you and done everything you told me to, Dad. And yet you never even gave me a goat for a party for my friends. I mean, like literal temper tantrum. I'm like, was he stomping his feet? He's not going to have a party. He's not going to celebrate. That's the kid who demanded everything he got. But what he's forgotten is that everything he sees is his. So because of his frustration with his dad, because of his anger towards his brother, he chooses to stand outside the party and pout and be angry as opposed to going in and celebrating and enjoying what's happened and enjoying the forgiveness that his dad has given to his brother. Joy is not something that comes like that, but it builds Think about my story with my stepmom. So on that night when Corey said, would you take me any place where I was going to be mistreated? I made a decision in that night that I was going to let go of this grudge. And it didn't go away overnight. You don't get rid of decades of bitterness and anger and frustration overnight. But it started by buying a Christmas gift. It started by making sure when we went home and that year we were going to my parents' house, making sure my stepmom had a gift from us underneath the Christmas tree. And I won't forget it, and I don't know if she still remembers it or not. She can tell me when she watches this on YouTube. That when all the Christmas gifts got open and there was one left, it was hers. And there was surprise on her face at the gift that she received. But over the years from that moment on, there have been a lot of moments of joy as I've watched her be a grandma to my kids. In a different way than my mom is, but still grandma. Grandma. And we've sat around the table and we've played board games and card games and we've shared stories and we've enjoyed being around each other. And joy has begun to build as I've chosen to let go of this grudge as the Holy Spirit has worked in my heart and allowed me to forgive. When we unsubscribe from our judges, grudges and learn to forgive those who have wronged us. Forgiveness opens our lives to the incredible blessings that God has for us. Blessings like joy and gratefulness and selfless living. 
So as you sit here today, is there anyone in your life you need to forgive? Is there a grudge or unforgiveness that you've held on to for years because you felt like you had the right to? See, I think it's really easy for us to forget how much we've been forgiven, how much we've been loved, how deeply in debt we were to the God who created us. But the truth is, each one of us has been forgiven a debt we could never, ever pay. So the real question for you and for me is will we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives so that we can set aside our selfishness, live with gratitude and joy, and unsubscribe from our grudges and forgive those who have offended us? Will you pray with me? God, we have been forgiven so much. More than we deserve, more than we're due, more than we're owed, You have forgiven us. You celebrate with us when we come and ask for your forgiveness. God, your grace doesn't end. You continue to pour it out and to lavish us, lavish it upon us. God, thank you for that. Thank you for the grace and the love and the mercy that we don't deserve. God, use your Holy Spirit to work in us and through us to help us let go of our grudges, to let, help us learn to forgive the way we've been forgiven. God, remind us of how much we've been forgiven. And God, make us a church that has a mission to go out into the world and to take that forgiveness that we've been given and give it freely to those around us so that they can know there's a God who loves them, a God who designed them, and a God who wants to be in relationship with them. A God who will forgive them no matter what they've done. A God who will welcome them with open arms no matter what. And so God, we ask that you would do that work in us. That you would make this a church that is known for its joy and its gratitude and its selfless living. God, that when our neighbors see us, they would know that we love and give grace like we have been loved and given grace to. God, we pray for those in our community who are poor, who are struggling, whether that be with physical, mental, or spiritual things, we ask that you would be at work in their lives. God, that you would be drawing them closer to you. God, that you would use us as your servants and as your vessels to go out. Father, we want to be followers of you. We want to do the best we can to be your ambassadors in this world. Give us the strength and the courage to help us each day, to push us forward. Would you pray with me now the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.